Is a computer classic crap on console? Is Tiny Toons 2 terrible? And is a Fury of the Furries facsimile still fun? It's December 1994, and this is Yesterzine. We're approaching the last Christmas the 16 bits will have their own way, which seems especially cruel for the SNES, which had been around in the UK about as long as the PS5 has in early 2023. Today's magazine Superplay is only on issue 26, but it's already over halfway through its run. The 16-bit generation is surprisingly short for the one people seem to have the most memories of, and that's ignoring that the 32-bit 3DO and the let's say it's 64-bit Jaguar were already on British shelves. Although on the shelves is exactly where most of them will stay, along with the imminent 32X. Nintendo's plan to extend the 16-bit era had already crashed and burned, but it would change video gaming forever nonetheless. A tie-up with Sony to develop a CD add-on and a standalone SNES CD went sour when Nintendo did a deal with Philips instead. If you don't know the story, if I told you the standalone SNES CD was going to be called the PlayStation, then you'd probably get the gist. The tie-up with Philips that caused the biggest selling video game brand of all time to be essentially created out of spite itself went nowhere, resulting merely in a smattering of Nintendo titles for Philips CDI, which, especially in the case of the two Zelda games, are remarkable entirely for their meme potential. This is illegal, you know. My cakes will burn! All of this is, already, ancient history a little over two years into the Super Nintendo's UK life. As we approach the end of 1994, the PlayStation is already out in Japan, and Superplay is already looking to the next wave of Nintendo hardware. I always wonder if pushing this amount of information in the UK on what would become the N64 well over two years before the UK would get to buy it did anything good for the sales of the SNES. But push it they did, devoting a page to news of the Ultra. They start well. Doom 64 would turn out to be something of a classic, more of a spiritual sequel than a port. The stated release date of autumn 1995 though turned out to be optimistic in the UK by over two years. Mortal Kombat 3 was apparently a no, but no one missed out there. The delay to the N64 meant Trilogy was a launch title for the machine in the UK anyway, along with the headline game, Cruisin' USA. In a world that already contained Ridge Racer and Daytona, leading with that was optimistic, as was Superplay's assertion that the arcade game's graphics would have to be upgraded on home conversion because the N64 was so powerful. I would humbly suggest that didn't happen. That's not even Nintendo's most imminent hardware release. Next up, a replacement for the five-year-old Game Boy, and Nintendo is going for a virtual reality headset for just £110. The VR32's naming would seem to fit with the Ultra 64's, but both would change before they saw a commercial release. Facts were scarce at this point, but to be fair, the machine as planned was nothing like its eventual form. Eventually launched as the Virtual Boy, it was missing the colour screen as Nintendo couldn't get it to look 3D. It also launched without proper motion tracking, Nintendo being wary of new Japanese legislation around liability of companies in these situations. So what was originally billed as being a PSVR 30 years early, became a unit which was fixed to a table and played games only in red on black. Project lead Gunpai Yokoi thought it shouldn't have been released at all, but Nintendo needed to make their money back, an estimated 3 million first year sales for a non-portable portable monochromatic not VR VR system launching after the PlayStation in most markets. Worse, it turned out that the decision to make it tabletop because of health concerns caused them instead. The way you had to play it gave a lot of people serious headaches. Nintendo lent 750,000 machines to Blockbuster, which backfired horribly as the worst thing you could do for the machine was to let people try it. They barely sold that many worldwide in the end, and the last of the 22 official games for the system, the slightly desperate 3D Tetris, was released less than a year after the machine's launch. The 64, while it had never matched the PlayStation, at least did better than that. We've still got the SNES though, and we've got a last Christmas right on top. 
So what's the first game in the Super Play review section this month to maintain its position as THE machine to have? Oh, it's an 18 month old Amiga release. What an 18 month old Amiga release though. Syndicate was Bullfrog's 8th game, but it's the second one most people remember and it's their graduation from One Trick Pony to Superstars. They'd made a debut with entirely forgotten Shooter Fusion, but it was Populous, the original god game that made them. And by 1993 they'd followed that up with a spin-off and a sequel, as well as perfectly nice platformer Flood and a couple of magazine exclusive mini games. Syndicate though was their difficult second strategy game, with a classic futures all gone a bit wrong plot involving corporations taking over from governments as the dominant force in everyone's lives, controlling people through commerce. Almost impossible to imagine isn't it? It absolutely hit the mark though. Even the stingy bastards at Amiga Power gave it 91% and they added a couple to that both if you had an A1200 and on reflection for its 1995 budget re-release. Somehow I've never played it. So what have we got here? Well on the face of it what in 2023 we'd call a weird combination of cannon fodder XCOM and Risk. With governments irrelevant you'll be taking over the world and you're going to start doing so in Northern Europe. You pick missions which will have certain goals such as doing a murder, rescuing allies before there is a murder or creating new allies via persuasion. The game tells you very little of this beyond mission briefings. It's assumed you're going to have read the manual. I have. In essence, rather than solve society's problems, a company called Eurotech invented an implantable chip that simply allowed people to ignore them. I'm surprised you needed a chip for that rather than four decades of right wing government but here we are I guess. Nonetheless, the chips had the predictable side effect that they allowed people to be controlled and manipulated, meaning that in this reality that red faced guy on your Twitter was actually correct. Scary thought. And so the usual. War, crime, corporate infighting and here we are. You are plucky aspiring megacorp. If you can't beat them, join them after all. To begin we need to blow up some malfunctioning cyborgs who are causing destruction and worse traffic jams in the middle of Munich. Before that though we have to go through the admin. It is a bullfrog game after all. You can buy your agents equipment to take into the mission although items may also be found within them. You'll lose anything you don't bring back so if an agent falls you're going to want to liberate their equipment on your way out. You can also upgrade an agent's cybernetics if you've researched and purchased said things and indeed you'll do that research as you go. It's a lot of management and it only gets more so as you later try to buy the right stuff to keep your agents in the right equipment and upgraded chests going forward. Nonetheless that's the risk and XCOM bit sorted. How about the cannon fodder? Well in game the basic loop is that your group ambles around separately or together depending on how you've got them set up and I immediately get someone killed by fat fingering the controls. Still we press on following the useful prompt at the bottom of the screen to hunt down where the enemy is. Syndicate uses a fixed perspective view which means if you're beside or worse inside a building you can see virtually nothing. There's no mechanism for hiding obstructions so you're forced to rely on the crosshairs and map to navigate around. You're supposed to do this mission easily and ignoring the agent I've left in a crumpled heap near the start we do so, gunning down the two targets and a couple of policemen who noticed what we were up to. Also two people who just looked at us funny because what use is a dystopian future if you can't gun down a few civilians. I've not seen a penalty for doing so. For the murder of two enemy agents we get possession of the whole of Western Europe, something which has historically not been that easy. We can leverage that to levy taxes on the population allowing us to pay for guns and major cosmetic surgery just like in modern hip hop. Here classic bullfrog balance gameplay comes in. Tax them too little and you might have to make do with only a gold plated machine gun. Tax them too much and there will be a revolt you'll have to put down. Saving occurs with passwords and mercifully Syndicate gives you a keyboard and mostly removes the characters that could look confusing in its weird font. 12 characters seems impossibly small to be recording everything this game can do. The reason for this of course is that it is. 
Your agents' names aren't stored and are generated every play session. Your tax rates in each territory reset to default and you have to re-equip your agents every time. Given how awkward all this admin is in the console version, then it barely feels like this expansive bullfrog game has a save system at all. It's not a game that chooses to overexplain itself. In this Scandinavian level, you start in what appears to be a situation where you're trapped. You can't get through the force field, although it does not hurt you. You cannot get through or over the fence, despite being badass cyborgs, and nor can you blow them up. I get timed out on the mission trying to figure this one out. Seasoned Syndicate players are yelling at me. You have to get in this car, something the game has never mentioned as a thing, although the button to do so is listed in the manual, and magically that can get through the gate, and you can park so the field is disabled. And so we continue. And this mission will do to work through a troubling revelation. I'm not having fun. Let's take the gameplay flow here. We have two jobs. First, we have to find and persuade the supervisor that he really wants to join our company. I would do this with a good health plan and decent pay. HR, though, has instead suggested shooting him with a magic gun. The gun is proximity based and the target is inside, so you're staring at a 16 pixel mini map and hammering the trigger to achieve this. This done, you need to eliminate a bunch of civilians who are presumably the cloned workers in temporary housing mentioned in the mission briefing, which again feels like poor HR process. For me, this is where the game goes downhill, as I spend the next 10 minutes trudging around the map, more than once mistaking building for bridge I can walk under, and occasionally shooting an entirely unarmed person who not only can't fight back, but barely seems to care. The last one, I lose inside a building, and rather than panic or run away or do anything much, they simply amble outside the building and all but wait for me to awkwardly extract myself and walk round. It's all strangely uninvolving. It probably doesn't help that the setting has led to it adopting the kind of grey-green-brown colour palette that would only become more popular for the next 15 years or so. Even so, it feels lifeless, especially when your agents can't even retain their own names from play session to play session, and the dynamic music system is hilariously jumpy and actively detrimental to the atmosphere. It also doesn't help that the SNES butchers the intro and between mission video to such a degree I'd have rather they didn't bother. There's a lot of criticism you can level at Bullfrog Games, especially when compared to the promises often made during their development, but rarely is that criticism a lack of atmosphere and sense of place. Yet you ask almost anyone who has played it, and Syndicate is a classic. So is this a console issue? The review in Superplay certainly thinks so. Zy Nicholson comes to it as a huge fan of the PC one and lays into it although he's doing so mostly for the controls, which is worth looking at. We mentioned Cannon Fodder earlier, and the console versions of Cannon Fodder would retain the adventure game style click where you want them to be controls of the computer versions of both games. This, you'll have noticed, has given me direct control, which means I have to wait for crosshairs to shoot people properly, and might well be the result of some of the building control issues. Zai makes the point that any kind of stealthy long distance gameplay is impossible, also, the maps have been cut down and the missions supposedly more repetitive. In retrospect, he's astonishingly generous giving this version 80%. I could end this here, and for less famous games I probably would, but I have to assume I'm the one missing something with Syndicate. I remember with Theme Park the correct decision was to play the PC version, and on the face of it that seems even more likely to be the case here. At least the intro now makes a load more sense, with text captions and a resolution you couldn't count on your fingers. It sets the scene a lot better and even the music seems improved. I wonder how many of these issues come from the SNES cartridge being about a quarter the size of the multi-disc Amiga data. The admin is near identical, but predictably the ability to use a mouse makes it a lot less tedious. It's not the world's best interface, but it's on a par with anything else from 1993 at least, and it allows me to do what I want to do, without going back to the manual to find why the button Nintendo insists is called Y means skip through pages and ignore anything you might want to do. 
The core gameplay also benefits from the mouse that the SNES version could have supported if it wanted to. It's not fixed to pathfinding though as Agent 3 decides to hang back and have a smoke while his friends attack the first of the level's enemies. Looting corpses is nicer too, a phrase you always have to be careful saying. I'm not sure I prefer the radar system on the map and its annoying beeping to the arrow of the SNES version, but it is functional. Buildings though remain impossible. How difficult would it have been to remove the roof while you were in there? Still though, as I move on to Mission 2 the issues remain. The map is for some reason 90 degrees to the play area, and group pathfinding continues to be awful. The job here is persuade two people, and both are inside buildings. Unlike the SNES one, they're not even marked on the actual play area, so your only recourse is to send a guy in and click like a madman until it makes persuaded noises. Worse, on the way out we're having a lovely walk down the very middle of the very straight road to get out, and one of the people I'm escorting decides to turn around and walk into a building for absolutely no visible reason. Unlike your agents, you can't take direct control over these people, so I have to double the whole party back and try to coax them out by doing some kind of agent mating dance until they walk out the door. It's annoying here, but if we were trying to extract under pressure and I permanently lost a good agent through this, then the PC would be going out the window. And again, while the cities are better, there's still no life to the thing. Levels are sparse and ill-populated. The lack of building interiors not only prevents you navigating, but also loses a big chance to add any personality. There's no sense these are living, breathing areas. This might as well be a stag do paintball trip most of the time. Mission 3 is similar. A simple go in and kill job where the awkward car controls mean I blow myself up trying to get out of one. Second try, we easily kill the few people we're supposed to murder with our upgraded Uzi machine guns, and then it's a simple matter of extracting. I try to do this with my car by loading the agents in and directing them out of town, whereupon the game decides instead to take a magical mystery tour of the city with no further prompting. I only ever clicked the entrance. Eventually the car gets stuck behind the abandoned police cruiser and will go no further forward or back. So I steal the police car, which also goes for a tour, before by clicking every two pixels I manage to convince it to the difficult task of going in a straight line. We're early in the game here, but the problem is, while these floors are merely irritating and sometimes even amusing at this stage, they are going to get me killed through no fault of my own later, and I'm not sure what this game has to make up for it. Cannon fodder is basically a simpler implementation of the same thing, and I was surprised to learn it came out later. But it does a similar thing better, and has a personality this is just entirely missing. I can see what Bullfrog were trying to do. I can even see how people would have enjoyed it 30 years ago. I can absolutely see why the 2012 reboot that recast this as a shooter was so badly received, when it's clear this could be done properly a la the XCOM reboots. But now? I wish I'd played it at the time, because these days I do not want to. And also, I can't in good conscience suggest you do if you missed it up till now. But if you do, that SNES version would be a mistake pick it up on PC at least. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what's the collective noun for a group of Amstrad GX 4000s? It's easy, there's never been two of them in the one place, so the question is irrelevant. More of a mystery is that this is a SNES focused episode, and this is not a SNES game. It's Callisto and I tried Concepts Fury of the Furries. Also, Callisto and I tried Concept are the same company, and at this time both were part of the publisher Mindscape. That part of the story is a bit weird and ends up in a long drawn out court case somewhere around 2002, which I don't think any of us especially care to dig into. Callisto is one of those names that might be faintly familiar to you, less likely on the SNES where they did little and we'll come to that, but if you were a PC player you might remember Ultimate Race Pro or the mess that was Al Unser Jr arcade racing from an old episode of this very show. But what they're most known for is the two Nightmare Creatures games. 
Late 90s survival horror on the Resident Evil bandwagon. Although the gameplay is more like the kind of thing Lara Croft would dream of after eating an entire cheese plate at half midnight. And you'll be thinking this is a bit atypical for them. And you'd be right. The game is Fury of the Furries, which is best described as a puzzle platformer for the European computers. It's a unique old game. You have four different personas, each of which come complete with a special ability. If it reminds me of anything, it's the Lost Vikings. But unlike in that game, where your three characters had to work together to get through any situation, here you only have the one character who can use one ability at a time. These exciting abilities are Fireball, performed by the Yellow Dude, Rope Swinging, performed by the Green Dude, Water Swimming, performed in a senseless act of stereotyping by the Blue Dude, and finally the ability to eat anything in sight, performed by your mum. Some levels don't give you free access to the abilities, either walling them off completely or using these gates which toggle certain abilities on and off. This level pretty much requires you to have the swing ability to finish it, but it's going to take a daring jump to get it. It's not the most polished of games. You may have caught that the platforming physics aren't exactly Mario. It's more pinball, in fact. There's a couple of jumps to get full height, but then you'll be bouncing all over the bloody place, and single hit death is the name of the game here, either on enemies or on the spikier parts of the scenery. Still, the levels seem to take this into account, and this has got to be an excuse to try and play through more of this. It fairly pointlessly has limited lies, but it also saves every five levels to give you half a chance. The characters in Fury don't belong to Callisto. The Tinies, as they're called, come from the Squeak franchise, from fellow French developers Loricel. Computer and handheld users may well recognise Squeak and Super Squeak, which made appearances on the Game Gear and Lynx, as well as French favourite the CPC and the 16-bit Micros. There's also Tiny Squeaks, a charming little puzzle game that was cruelly given the Mark of the Beast by Total this very month. It too was by Callisto and appeared on the SNES under the name Brainies, as it was deemed SNES owners, especially Americans, would not be at all interested in squeaks or tinies. Not the first time that decision had been made, because here's the point of this little diversion. In order to release Fury of the Furries in America, Mindscape and Callisto talked to Namco, who hit upon the idea of erasing the tinies from the game and replacing them with, and get ready for this one, Pac-Man. For the PC, Macintosh and Game Boy versions, this was almost literally a graphic swap of Pac-Man for the four colours of furry. Perfectly fine on Game Boy, but a bizarre choice on the two computers which had both received the original. And that's why, despite knowing all of the above for a long time, I've overlooked what became known excellently as Pac-In Time. After all, I have the original, and it's basically the same, with better music. There are, to be fair, a few minor differences. The fancy new intro where the game's premise is explained as Pac-Man being banished back into the past is one, although the immediately following screen furniture means Pac-Man himself looks massively out of place. In-game, there are three differences. Two good, one bad. So let's shit sandwich this. Difference the first. Switching between the four pack abilities can now be done by hitting Alt rather than the tedious method employed by Fury, which involves at least three button presses. Difference the second. You've no idea which Pac-Man you are unless you interpret the tiny icons in the bottom left, because, presumably at Namco's behest, Pac-Man's actual appearance doesn't change when you've got different coloured tinies in the original. Difference the third. If you do die, and you'll die, you restart fairly instantaneously, whereas in Fury it slowly loads a death animation and then the level again, every single time. Which one you should play on that basis is beyond me. The real answer is probably the Amiga version on an emulator with save state support so you can avoid that loading. Either way, until today, I'd not played Pack in Time because I already had Fury. In fact, I still do, on an actual CD. And that's where I was wrong. Because for reasons I'm not sure I understand, the SNES version alone is an entirely new game. As a big fan of the original, 
It's a very weird thing to discover that there is an effective sequel nearly 30 years after the fact, and it gets a very healthy 84% from Tony Mott. So let's take a look. It doesn't take long to realise that, while this is a new game, we're still following the same formula. We'll be picking up the same four abilities over the course of this level for instance, and it also does not take long to realise its approach to platform physics is, if anything, more batshit in this than in the original. There is one difference. The token pickups, the identity of which I've not successfully worked out, were all but optional in most of Fury. If there was a minimum requirement for them, I never saw it on screen or got to the exit having not met it. Here though, where presumably they're just Pac-Man pills, you will need to collect every single one of them in the level to be allowed to exit it. It makes sense of course, that's how Pac-Man works in general, but it's going to require exploration. To compensate, as I will discover later, a lost life will put you back at the start of the level with everything you've achieved so far still in that state, which is a time saver. Kinda too is the life system itself, as Pac now has an energy bar rather than suffering from immediate one hit death, and there are liberal health items throughout the levels. The game also takes advantage of the SNES by moving the changing of abilities to the left and right bumpers, and by of course not having any loading issues, making restarts near instant. You'll need these concessions because of the other thing I noticed in my short play session that they've taken from Pac-Man lore for this version. The ghosts make an appearance and they can home towards you. They're tricky to avoid, which is why it's a good thing you don't have to. Usually, situated near their spawn point is a larger power pill, which does exactly what you think it might. These also last a good amount of time, so at least in the early levels the ghosts are more of a distraction than a danger, and I say that fully admitting to dying to one. It's really the bare minimum of effort to make a Pac-Man game out of what is an existing, unrelated template, but it does give the SNES one a reason for being that the PC and Mac ones simply do not have. It's worth playing if you're a fan of Fury. It feels like a sequel, a slightly lazy sequel, but a sequel nonetheless. It's also worth a look if you're just a SNES gamer. It's a relatively unique game on the system and still retains the feel of the Amiga game it really is underneath. Games like Tearaway Thomas and the Collectathon Euro platformers didn't make the SNES too often, and the fact this one did should be celebrated. Although, if pushed, if you've played none of them, I'd cut the bullshit and just play Fury itself on Amiga or DOS. That's the actual game. Everything else is just capitalism happening. We've got a fight here, because our final game of the episode happens to be the gaming hell, and that's interesting for several reasons. Konami were a super nizzy powerhouse. Quite beyond the Castlevanias and the Contras, they produced one of the glorious platform licensed games of our time in Tiny Toons Buster Bus Loose. This SNES exclusive has an effortless charm and reflects its host material better than almost any license you care to name. Tiny Toons was a cartoon about the next generation of Warner Brothers characters at Acme Luniversity. It was created in the early 90s by Amblin, a company set up by Steven Spielberg in his pre-DreamWorks days. Fans of 80s movies may find the logo strangely familiar, and if you don't remember E.T., you've seen it on Jurassic Park in the days before the only fun to be found in the new film is trying to spot Jane Douglas from outside Xbox in it. It's one of those great generation of 90s cartoons where the kids enjoy it but there are clearly some jokes thrown in entirely to cater to the adults. Like an extended sequence predicated on you knowing in the late 60s there were musical groups called Yes and The Band. No, that's not the band. The band is performing later on. Who's on stage? It's a game I love so much I have it three times on SNES, one for each major region. It's a platform fan essential. If you tuned in to this episode looking for something new from the Super Nintendo back catalogue to play, then ignore anything else that gets mentioned and just grab yourself this. It's not an expensive game to buy in cart form even. That's two years old though, and Amblin had another series starring the Warner Brothers and the Warner Sister Dot. Tonally it was very similar to Tiny Toons and also gave the world the all time great characters that are Pinky and the Brain. Animaniacs very much doubled down on the jokes for adults thing. 
For instance, consider they got away with broadcasting the following at 10am on a Sunday. I found prints! No, 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 fingerprints! I don't think so. And like Tiny Toons, there's a game for SNES from Konami, and it's a themed platformer. We should absolutely be on to a winner, but it's the lowest rated game in this entire issue, getting 28% from Amiga Power legend Jonathan Nash. And on the face of this, it had become an investigation of what went wrong since Buster Bust Loose. But there's one thing that makes this more interesting to me. Because remember I mentioned that issue of Total that had Brainies in? Being from the same month, unsurprisingly, Animaniacs is reviewed in that as well where it gets 89. What's going on here? Nothing you can detect from the intro. One of the things that Tiny Toons did superbly, with the aid of some incredibly well-drawn graphics, is get across the feel of the cartoon. And even without the iconic voices, Animaniacs is doing just as well. Rarely, for the series, it puts Megalomaniac Mouse Brain directly up against the main characters, as Pinky and the Brain have stolen all the pages from a new Warner Brothers movie script. Having seen some of their recent output, it may be a kindness. But the studio boss doesn't see it that way, and recruits our heroes to retrieve them by visiting each of the theme sets on the Warner movie lot in pursuit of our rebellious rodents. So far, so Tiny Toons. But here's where things change. All three of the main characters on screen. This is mostly cosmetic. You'll only be controlling one and their abilities are identical. Mostly it's a representation of the number of lives you have left. If you don't pick up any extras, you'll lose each of the characters as they're caught by security and returned to the water tower. Why security were not told you're on a mission from the CEO, I don't know. But having worked in a big company, I am also not surprised. Get used to this tutorial corridor. You'll probably see it a few times. But all it's teaching us is picking up, throwing, destroying, pushing. It also takes the chance to throw in a couple of the series characters we're used to. The characters' reactions to standing near Hello Nurse, for instance, are great and very much sell the tie to the series itself. The meat of the game though is those stages, and it's here the game is setting out its stall for being a heck of a lot more difficult than Tiny Toons was. You can absolutely die on the map screen if, for instance, you're weighing up your options and the security guard catches up with the group. It's the difficulty that I think is going to be half of what split the reviewers of this game on original release. For the rest, we're going to have to try out some of the stages, several of which are immediately open to you. How about the fantasy zone, where we get to ride broomsticks and somehow do so without taking absurd stands against people's right to basic existence? Which is also where this game reveals it's not actually a platformer. The job here is to rush along the tracks, changing position to avoid trees and jump tree stumps. And I die a lot. It's too quick to see, so you have to attempt to follow the white rabbit. Even then though, you'd probably have to try and memorise the whole section to get through it reliably. This is the specific bit Jay Nash calls out in the review as being especially tedious, and he's probably not wrong. That said, I'm not really having his problem of working out which track the rabbit is on. After all, you can see it move up and down, and you're presumably on the same track as him to start with. If you've lost track of where it is, then you are in fact already buggered, so it's somewhat irrelevant. I say get used to the tutorial corridor because I've yet to get a page of the script, and so when I die, yes, it gives me a pass grid to potentially respawn back at the map, but in reality, it would take long enough to enter that speedrunning those first two screens takes less time. It's only going to be a problem until I get some actual progress, I guess, but it feels like something's gone wrong, especially as it's astonishingly easy to lose those three lives in about four seconds. Take the sci-fi stage. I battle far enough along to reach a restart point, but then you have to deal with the classic Spielberg being chased by a boulder bit. Again, from a standing start, I fail to figure out the exact combination of jumps, dashes and runs that gets me over it, and this section cost me a game over in about 10 seconds total, and now I have to redo the rest of the level again. If you're idly wondering, it was at this point in the narrative that I realised that unlike Syndicate, I was playing this on an emulator and thus had save states. There was a slight pause as I went away for a little cry. 
It doesn't change the fundamental problem though. If you pass by the rock section, which I do manage to do after about 10 minutes of restarting, you get dropped into a fairly simple mini boss fight, and then another section which is basically the same mechanic as the broom chase where you avoid lasers. The whole game at times feels less like a coherently designed campaign and more a collection of loose mini games strewn together. Worse, reading walkthroughs reveals that you could easily finish entire levels and miss pages contained within. This is a problem because the game also doesn't appear to tell you in which level the ones you're missing are located. On reflection I almost see the point of both magazines. The individual parts of this game can be very good, and if you were to do a sequel where you merely designed a game around the existing engine, you could make something different too, but every bit as good as Buster Bust Loose. But this isn't it. If you've rinsed Buster Bust Loose and you're doing it on something with save states, hey, give this a try. Its charm and personality go a long way towards hiding the flaws. But if you're not, or you haven't played Tiny Toons, do that. Because sadly, as happens more often than not, if there's a disagreement between two reviewers, it's the Amiga Power alumnus who is correct. On the back page is not what was supposed to be there thanks to the postponement of an important charity event for a list of calamities that one day we might all look back on and laugh. Not now though. Which means we need a nicely non-controversial replacement fast. Um, how about this lovely new arcade in Norwich? It's going to have as many pay per play arcade machines as they can cram in there and a bar serving what they are apparently legally speaking allowed to call food. For £20 they'll write your name on a wall, and how else do you do that except in the public toilets below an advert for something quotas mean I can't name. So see the description for a link to the Kickstarter the whole of social media has described as a perfectly sensible and reasonable plan that none of us can possibly find a way to object to. And join us here last Friday in April for another magazine picked up and shaken until all the pages fall out, because the publishers used the lowest bidder to do the perfect binding again. See you soon.